This video introduces the concept of the steady state approximation. Uh, in the last couple of videos, we're examining how consecutive reactions take place and how we can analyze them from a kinetics perspective. All right, so that's a consecutive reaction, a uh, reagent to give an intermediate liquids product, and then the rate constants that control the reactivities are K1 and K2. Right, we have solved this, um, the kinetics for this process using no approximations two videos ago. And then in the prior video, we have uh, examined what happens when uh, you have that this rate constant is much greater than that, uh, meaning that this step will be slow with respect to that one. All right, uh, that approximation of the rate limiting step was very useful because it simplifies tremendously uh, the integrated rate loss, uh, especially that for products. Uh, but uh, uh, occasionally, it's going to be difficult to uh, make a comparison between K1 and K2 and uh, determine conclusively uh, that this one will be greater than that one or the other way around, right? So sometimes the rate, rate constants are comparable and then uh, we cannot invoke that approximation. However, uh, it's going to be uh, uh, more often the case that when you have an intermediate, uh, that intermediate reaches something that is called steady state. Okay, so for example, a uh, steady state would be something like this. Uh, suppose that we were to plot here the concentrations as a function of time. And this will be your uh, reagent in the case that will be your product, it grows. And then when you plot the intermediate, uh, at time zero you won't have any concentration, but then after some induction period, okay, the concentration is very, very low, okay, but it seems to stay constant, constant as part of time. Many reactions actually uh, that have intermediates, uh, uh, this approximation is very valid. Co the concentration of the intermediate after some induction period where it grows, uh, just remains more or less constant as a function of time. And again, that happens more frequently than um, uh, the red limiting step in which it's very obvious that one uh, step is faster than the other one. Right, so the question is, well, how do we um, introduce this steady state approximation for an intermediate into our mechanism? Right, so we're, uh, we're going to do this on these uh, consecutive reactions that, we're, that have served as a benchmark uh, for the last couple of videos. All right, so the, uh, what we're trying to do here is find out what the uh, rate of product formation is. Okay, so what is the change uh, in product concentration as a function of time? And when we examine the reaction mechanism, we recognize that only the second uh, step is going to uh, give us product. Okay, so that will be the rate law. And again, a problem with this rate law is that it has a concentration in the intermediate, and that's something that uh, it, it has to be avoid, avoided. Um, in the orbital rate. But, so the question is, well, how do we actually replace this concentration of intermediate by something useful? And again, uh, uh, what we've done before is actually not establishing approximations. And again, when we've solved that with our approximations, this happens to be a quite complicated differential expression. We we'll look at the solutions, but again, they're complicated. You're going to see how with the steady state approximation, this actually becomes much, uh, much easier, more, much more tractable. All right, so the question is how do we can uh, how we can uh, obtain this concentration of intermediate um, uh, from the steady state approximation? All right, so uh, the key of the steady state approximation is to recognize that the concentration of the intermediate doesn't change in time. All right, so then you can write that if I reaches a steady state, then the rate or the concentration doesn't change on time. Okay, that would be the steady state approximation. Now, we can also uh, uh, write this uh, using the rate law of that particular um, intermediate, right? So we can say that the rate of I would be equal to the rate of the reactions that are producing I minus the rate of the reactions that are removing I from solution, okay? So we can say that uh, that is equal to K1 concentration of A, the rate of the reactions that are generating the intermediate minus the rate of the reactions that are removing the intermediate from the reaction mixture. And again, if I reaches a steady state, then we know that this is going to be equal to zero. That rate is going to be equal to zero. Okay, so uh, no, notice that now we actually have a very simple uh, uh, expression here in which we were going to find that uh, K1 concentration of A is equal to K2 concentration of I. Or in, in other words, the rate of the reactions that form I has to be identical to the rate of the reactions that remove I. Okay, we can solve this expression for I. Again, that expression is going to give us K1 over K2 
times the concentration of A. Okay, which looks like a very simple uh, uh, function of the concentration. So notice that this expression is actually not, not very complicated at all. Okay, and again, that is one of the keys of these approximations. They simplify tremendously the treatment. Right, so now the next thing that we can do after we have uh, determined what the concentration of I is using the steady state approximation is to come back to the rate law for product formation and then replace. Okay, we'll have that K2 is going to be equal to K1 over K2 times the concentration of A. Okay, and notice that these two things will cancel out. And then we'll have that, uh, again, this differential of P, differential of T. This is uh, equal to K1 times the concentration of A. But notice that A uh, decays uh, as a first order uh, exponential. Okay, and this is the rate law. That will be K1 concentration of A at time zero, E to the minus K1T. Okay, so again, notice how uh, we have simplified uh, enormously here. Uh, the mathematical complexity of this. This is actually a differential equation that we are going to solve because it's not that complicated. All right, so let's see how we solve that. Again, the first thing that you would do is um, uh, separate variables, and then you would have that differential of P okay, is going to be equal to, let me rearrange terms here, uh, K1 concentration of A at time zero, and then E to the minus K1T differential of T. Okay. Right, so integrating from the start of the reaction where the concentration of P is zero to uh, any time, and then the integration of time will be from time is equal to zero to time is equal to T. Okay, notice that these two, uh, uh, K1 and A0, those are factors, so they factor out of the integral, and what we actually have to integrate is only the exponential term from zero to T. Okay. Alright, let's actually try to do that. K1, concentration of A at time zero, and then the integral of E to the minus K1T is going to be equal to minus one over K1, and then the same exponential. Okay, and now we have to evaluate this from T is equal to zero to T is equal to T. Okay. All right, let's see uh, how that uh, is finished. Uh, notice that this K1 is going to be cancelled with that K1, and then I can take the minus sign out of the um, parentheses there. And then we have that this is simply going to be equal to the concentration of P minus zero, and that is equal just to the concentration of P. Okay, so the concentration of products is going to be equal to minus A zero, and then we have to evaluate this exponential between the limits of the integral. Okay, so to evaluate the limits, we just take the uh, value of t and plug it into this expression, so that it's going to be equal to e to the minus k1t, and then subtract whatever happens when we plug this limit into this function. Okay, so that would be e to the uh, minus k1 zero. Okay, I notice that uh, e to the zero is equal to one. Okay, and we can do uh, rearrange this expression by changing the sign inside the parentheses and then outside, and this is going to be equal to A naught, one minus E to the minus K one T. Okay, that is your final uh, concentration of product or integrated real law for product, okay, uh, after the steady state approximation has been invoked. Now, something that is very useful here is to recognize that this um, expression is identical to what we have obtained uh, if we assume that the second step is fast compared to the first one, that this K2 is much larger uh, than that K1. Okay, and they should be the same because they, uh, uh, the state step approximation requires that uh, as soon as a little bit of intermediate has been formed, it should react steadily so that the concentration of the intermediate does not reach a very high value. And those are situa a situation that is very, very similar or identical in the case of consecutive reactions as to assuming that the second step is very fast, right? So whenever you get a little bit of I, it's just going to react towards products. And the really limiting step is simply the production of an intermediate. Okay, even though for this particular set of, uh, uh, for this uh, a reaction, a consecutive reaction, 
it looks like both uh, the steady, uh, steady approximation and assuming that the second step is fast and give you identical results, uh, again, I'm trying to convince you here that the steady state approximation uh, is actually going to be generally more useful than uh, uh, the, the approximation in which we can neglect one rate with respect to the other because uh, it's more frequent. The conditions for uh, to be able to determine that the step is fast versus slow, uh, those conditions are much more stringent than the conditions with, under which we obtain a steady state for the intermediate. Okay, so again, even though they produce the same results in this particular uh, uh, mechanism right here, uh, the conditions for the steady state approximation are much more common, much more frequent, and then we're going to be using that uh, steady state approximation very frequently, especially when we look at enzyme mechanisms.